Welcome, welcome. It is Monday, March 25th, 2024. I'm Gabe Hernandez, you're publishing the EIC. So today we're gonna to look at DC and their forthcoming event, which is called Absolute Power. And we know from some tidbits that I'll cover in a minute, why we think this event is probably going to lead to it, at the very least, a creative team reboot, if not a line-wide reboot of the universe. So it's sort of a in-between reboot, maybe, maybe not, but we'll find out. So what you have up on the screen in front of you is the press release, the formal press release that DC uh, released during, uh, in February 2022nd, uh, 20, February 22nd of this year. And I'm just going to talk through it a little bit, but then we're going to add some context and flavor after that. So throughout the dawn of DC, Amanda Waller's combination of pure ruthlessness and dangerous alliances has placed her on the precipice of fulfilling her pledge, the elimination of all metahuman abilities planet-wide. That's basically true if you're up to speed on DC Comics. This summer, her plans take a major step forward with absolute power, DC's big summer blockbuster. Helmed by the critically acclaimed duo of Mark Wade and, and Dan Mora, that team right there is key. We'll talk about that in a minute. This four-issue series launches July 2nd, so July, and shows how Waller will use the strategic and military might of failsafe and otherworldly technology of the Brainiac Queen to steal all metahuman abilities from every superhero and supervillain around the globe. A threat so dire, it will take the combined efforts of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, the original Trinity, and the superheroes of the DC Universe to defeat it. Okay, so it sounds like a very typical event. Let's peel that apart a little bit. So what's happening? You have a new evil trinity that's being formed during this, this summer event, which starts in July. Amanda Waller has been pervasive throughout all the DC comics that, that DC has published probably over the last six months to a year. She's operating the background, making moves, some of which make sense, a lot of them that don't. Uh, for example, in the latest, latest issue of Titans, Titans number nine, she got into a stare down contest with Trigon and he backed off. I get what you're trying to do. You're trying to elevate Waller to this almost uh, omnipotent type of uh, master of manipulation and uh, leverage, which I get why you want to do that. Whether or not they actually succeeded in laying that foundation, that's a different story. So she's the mastermind of everything that's going on. Now that Trinity has two other players, Failsafe. Failsafe is effectively a robot version of Batman that was built by the un untethered version of Batman's psyche called Zurin R. So if you don't read Batman, you have no idea who Failsafe is. Failsafe is effectively a robot Batman who, with some empathy, who is not constrained by his killing mandate. And currently he is now, uh, imbued with the personality of a split version of Batman's psyche. I know it sounds complicated. You have to be reading Batman to Chip Zdarsky's Batman to be up to speed on what that is. But if you want to think of it, he's an evil robot Batman. Okay. Brainiac Queen. This character has not yet been introduced. It doesn't exist anywhere. In the forthcoming uh, Superman arc, which is a Brainiac arc, is where that character will come to be. I don't know why there needs to be a Queen Brainiac. We'll find out. Is the story good? I don't know. Will she be elevated to the level that is worthy of a big summer tentpole event that's going to restart the DC universe? I don't know, but we'll find out. So they're taking a lot of risks here because they're relying upon Amanda Waller, who has admittedly been saturated throughout the multiple issues and multiple titles in DC over the past year, sometimes to great effect sometimes not, uh, relying on a villain character that was created in only one title, which is Batman. Uh, and his the re critical reception of Batman has been very down lately. Started strong, went downhill pretty quick. And then you're, the third character is relying upon a villain who hasn't even been introduced yet. So there's a lot of risky eggs in a very small basket that DC's taking here. So what about the creative team? We've got Mark Wade and Dan Mora. That is probably the best creative team DC has at their disposal right now. World's Finest is one of the best comics, in my opinion, one of the best comics that DC has on the shelves right now. Every time Dan Wade and uh, Mark Wade and Dan Moore get together, uh, it's, it's some of the best quality work that you're going to get out of DC. Just that's just the way it is. So, what do we know about the outcome? What's around that event with from a comics perspective? Well, of course, they're not just going to do a four-issue event and just put it out there. There's going to be tie-ins, so many tie-ins. 
We don't know all of them. We haven't had a lot of supplemental or follow-up information since the February 22nd release, but we do know some things from our fine folks over here at um, uh, League of Comic Geeks, which tends to aggregate a lot of the stuff for ordering and browsing. Uh, we know we're going to get a Suicide Squad Dream Team um, uh, arc, if you will, that's currently in process. I don't think anybody's reading that. I don't think anybody likes it particularly much, but it's supposed to set the stage for um, what Mander Wall is doing since she is intrinsically linked to Suicide Squad. Then we have the free comic book day release, which is going to be on May 4th. We're going to be there. We're going to pick up that issue. And that's presumably going to give us a lot of the foundational information for the event itself, which starts in July. And then the we have some prologue information also in Suicide Squad Dream Team, Superman, presumably because that's where Brainiac Queen is going to come from, and Green Arrow number 13. That's where um, Amanda Waller has effectively... I won't say coerce. Yeah, coerce is probably the right word. Green Arrow into being a member of her team along with Roy Harper. And then Absolute Ground Zero, which is effectively going to be the zero issue, if you want to call it that, even though they're calling it number one. I don't know why you have to say Ground Zero or number one when the issue is going to be a zero issue, but okay. So lots of lead up to get to this event. Then we have a four issue event, and then we're going to have all the tie-ins that come along with it, presumably on the other titles. And so from an ecosystem, as far as how many comics you need to buy, you really only need to buy the four, but you do have a lot of prologue, prologue issues. Recommendations, I would I would definitely strongly recommend picking up the free comic book day, the Absolute Power Special Edition, because one, it's free, so that makes sense. Two, probably more information is going to be contained in there that tells you exactly what the event's going to, what that event is about. And so if you're an LCS owner, you have to stock all this stuff. And for if you're an LCS owner catering to DC fans, there is quite a few tie-ins mostly related to the Suicide Squad. So that shouldn't be a surprise. What happens as a side effect of this, issue, of this event, we don't really know for sure. But we do know a few things. Number one, we know that there are several creative teams who are off their respective books. For sure, we know that Ram V is off of De Detective Comics in September. For sure, we know that Tom Taylor is off Nightwing in September. Rumored or strongly suggested, but not for sure, we know that Tom King is off Wonder Woman in September. And rumored and not for sure, we know that Cy Spurrier is off Flash in September. Based upon the description of the press release and the subsequent impact to the general DC universe, that seems to suggest that at the very least, the comics are going to have, at least line-wide, are going to have a soft reboot with new creative teams and a new strategic direction. And based upon the context of what the, the fight is about, it looks like the Justice League, which was disbanded last year, somewhere around the Lazarus Planet, I think, event, if I remember correctly, uh, they're going to come back together. And so now you're going to have a Justice League book, if I understand correctly, probably written also by Mark Wade with art by Dan Mora, which would be a big positive for that particular title. So that's a lot going on. That's a lot happening. A lot is relying upon titles that you have to be intimately aware of to kind of figure out who the pieces are, that relying upon characters that don't even exist yet, at least from a publishing standpoint, and relying upon nebulous changes after the fact, which would suggest a line-wide reboot, but at the very least we know there's going to be a creative team reboot for multiple titles. Is that enough to get everybody excited about DC and, and to kind of swing the tide as far as getting enthusiasm up because DC right now is it, when you come to, when it comes to publisher rankings, it's still Marvel, but DC has been losing ground to image. And in some, depending on which month you look at, uh, they're number three to image with uh, image doing their energon universe. So that may be a good thing. Maybe a not bad thing. Who knows? Will, is this going to work out for DC? I don't know. The last two or three events that have, that, that, that DC has pulled off have been duds. Uh, Dark Crisis was a dud. Lazarus Planet or Lazarus Rain uh, was a semi-dud. Uh, Night Terrors was an absolute failure. Gotham War was was very bad. And when you start, and that was just in the course of essentially a year or less. And so when you start stacking those things up together, DC does not have a good track record for events. Now, this event is being written primarily by Mark Wade, who is a 
massively better writer than Joshua Williamson, who's responsible for most of those events from last year, but we'll see how it turns out. So that's it. What do you think about absolute power? Does it get you excited knowing that an evil Trinity is going to be facing off against the DC Trinity? Is that, is that enough to get you going? The fact that we're going to get it Justice League rebooted probably in the early fall, is that enough to get you excited? The fact that most of the creative teams on some of the bigger titles like Detective and Nightwing and possibly Wonder Woman and Flash are all getting replaced with a new set of creatives, is that enough to get you excited? Personally, not really. I mean, you feel like you're either going, you're either taking a lateral move or you're going a little bit less. I don't know. It sort of depends on who you replace the, the, the old creatives with the new creatives and what they intend to do with the titles going forward. Uh, it's hard to tell. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of uncertainty about this title. They're putting a lot of eggs in, again, in a very small basket, but that's the way it is. So, but I want to know your thoughts. What do you think about DC? What do you think about this forthcoming Absolute Power event? What do you think about the possibility of a line-wide reboot, or at least a line-wide creative team reboot? And does it make a difference for you? Does this get you back on board with DC if you fell off? Or if you're already a diehard DC, does this keep you interested and keep you excited? And in particular, if you're an LCS owner, what do you think about trying to stock all these titles and trying to convince people that this is a good thing? How are you going about that marketing message? Because as we know from the big two in our, our review last, in our uh, newsletter last week, uh, marketing is not the strong suit of the big two. So leave a comment down below. Let us know what you think. And next week, if you stay tuned and subscribe, please subscribe. Next week, we're going to talk about Marvel and Blood Hunt. So I hope you found this interesting or at least uh, informational. Thank you very much for joining. This is Gabriel Hernandez, your comic opinions publisher in EIC. You have a great day. Wait a minute. I almost forgot. <laughs> Don't go away just yet. Uh, a couple things. Back to our newsletter. All right. If you're I hope you enjoyed that uh, video about uh, DC Comics and Absolute Power, but, but don't forget, we also have the newsletter. So a couple things on that. First off, we're posting the audio versions of our pick of the week, which is the comic uh, that we reviewed that we thought was kind of the strongest and the best and the one that you're going to get the most enjoyment out of. Our winner this week is G.I. Joe, our real American hero, number 305 from Image Comics and Skybound. The Energon universe is killing it. We've seen that multiple, multiple times before. So if you're listening to this on podcast instead of watching this on YouTube or reading uh, on Substack, which is where we post our newsletter, uh, check it out. You're going to enjoy it. And let's talk about also the reviews that we have coming up this week with a, a little bit of a surprise. We've got a new publisher on the list. Uh, first of all, we're going to do Simon Says, number three, Humbaba, number two, both from Blood Moon Comics, horror comics, of course, Dead Detective, number five, from Black Box Comics, which is great. Maybe, this is tentative, maybe we'll have Street Fighter Masters, Akuma versus Ryu, number one, from Udon. They might be behind on their schedule. We have an in with them, but they're they're struggling to kind of keep up with the publishing cycle for an assortment of reasons that that's understandable. Everybody's going through that problem. We'll We'll catch up. Big week for tight, for Image, uh, Duke number four and King Spong number th 32. So Duke is a strong front runner for pick of the week. But now we're up against a heavy hitter, Conan number nine from Titan Comics. So I'm interested to see how Duke versus Conan shapes up in the pick of the week uh, category. And here now here's our new surprise, Zorro Man of the Dead number three from Massive Publishing. This is our first comic review for Massive. Uh, they reached out to us to say, hey, we like your reviews. Can you review our stuff? We said, sure. And now we're going to kind of sort of ease into it and see if we can develop an ongoing rela relationship with Massive. That's a good thing. Uh, we have Red Sonja volume seven number nine from Dynamite. Three titles from Zenoscope, Van Helsing Vampire Hunter number three, which ends that three-part miniseries from Pat Shand, Grim Fairy Tales volume two number 82, which is a continuation of their main series, and Holmes and Houdini number three from Zenoscope, that also ends that particular three-part miniseries. Then from Bad Cave, we have Morningstar number one, which is a new uh, series. Not sure about that one yet. We'll, we may or may not cover that one ongoing. We'll see. Tard Remains number four and Eden Frost, number four, all from Mad Cave. And then we have two indie submissions. One is Worms Crawl Out. If you remember way back when, we did Worms Crawl In. So this is a sort of a follow-up um, indie publishing uh, effort. And Fungi, number one, which is an indie submission, but technically speaking, this was originally published or supposed to be published by Scout, which is going through some, uh, how should we say, troubles right now. So if you're paying attention, uh, We'll keep our eye on what's going on with Scout, but we'll see going forward. And if that's a good title, we'll follow it anyway. We'll reach out to the creator directly. So that's it. 
Make sure you subscribe to the newsletter. We want to keep you up to date on what's going on, including the videos, uh, our audio podcasts, and all the written reviews. And we hope you enjoyed this one. So thank you very much. And you have a great day.